into the system. That would at least lower the price of Japanese products, promoting the growth of exports. The American Treasury Secretary Rubin initially gave his approval to the solution. He gave a congressional report, testimony on June 11th. Mr. Rubin implied that there was little the authorities could do to stop the yen from falling. In other words, we are not going to put any money to stop the Japanese yen from falling. That was his testimony in Congress June the 11th. Because he's the one who taps into that, remember that, uh, that stabilization fund, that 40 billion that they pull out and give to everybody? So we're giving it to the Japanese. Financial markets took matters into their own hand and in the meltdown of the yen suddenly seemed for real positive. So in other words, the people who trade the money said, you're not going to give US money to prop up Japan? I may lose my money from Japan. Everybody start pulling. And then it drops down again. See, but when you can feed yourself, and house yourself in the Congo, you don't care about them playing with the money there. You got something to eat, you got water, you got herbs, that's what counts. There is where China stepped in and said, fearful that a free fall in the Japanese currency would spur another round of currency devaluation in elsewhere in Asia, putting more pressure on their economy, the Japanese are saying, Chinese officials made it clear that a chain of events would be unacceptable for them to let the yen drop. Then they placed their trump card to the America, warning that they would, be, they would be forced to reconsider a stance on their currency. If you don't back the Japanese currency, I'm going to do something to my currency you may not like. China was very careful and deliberate in upping the ante, led by two of its most uh, uh, on its uh, ministers, and they go to minister of the central bank. They did not suggest, they, these two Chinese officials did not suggest that the official policy of a stable yuan. So we're talking about, what are we talking about? We're talking about the yen, the Japanese yen, beginning to drop. Because the economy is, can no longer grow and a number of other factors we will see. The Chinese yuan is China. So the Chinese are saying, if you let the yen continue to drop in value, I may do something to my currency you may not like. But of course, China is not important, so it don't make a difference. Then they played the Trump card, warning that they would be forced to reconsider the stance on, they, on their currency. China was very careful and deliberate in upping the ante, led by two, okay, I read that part. And then he says, they, would, uh, they did not suggest the official policy of a stable yen was about to change, but they both voiced their concern about the ultimate implication of an open-ended depreciation of the yen, threatening to devaluate their money. A devaluation by China would cause currencies in, in Asia to tumble. We can have it on an already stable economy. The currency contagion could have spread to Latin America and Eastern Europe. So China's saying, I'll pull them. if I devaluate my money, you might have some repercussions throughout the world. But by the middle of the month, when the yen was plummeting towards 150 against the dollar, China's leaders and global advisors had good reason to fear that the country might not be able to hold its currency stable. So you got this big, powerful Japan on paper about to collapse. And Japan can't feed itself. So the Congo has no stock and no bond and no factory but can eat. Japan has stock and bonds and factories but can't feed itself. You cut it off, you collapse the country. Remember what they said in Trilateral, that if the Africans cut off the mineral wealth to the rest of the world, Japan will collapse in six months, Western Europe will collapse in six months, and America will go out in, a, in less than a year. That's your power. You don't need the atomic bomb at this point. And at, the, and, and, and at this point, the world had no choice but to take heed of this risk. And the United States and Japan were forced to step in to start supporting the yen. So China told the United States and Japan, China told them, you US and Japan, you support the yen or I'm going to do something. In the end, it was that simple. China flexed, world financial markets responded. China don't have anything in the stock market here. And global financial officials acted. China's impact as an international economic power has never been greater. But we're going to see why. 
courtesy of the recent uprising and resumption, and in addition, courtesy of the recent and surprising resumption of nuclear testing by India and Pakistan, two black countries whites no longer control directly like this, China lose more important in this whole balancing act. Interestingly enough, and it goes on, later at another, uh, conf another lecture, if, we have, uh, if we're able to come back, or even if we have time, we can then see the impact of the bombs that India and China, India and Pakistan exploded. Let's go on. New York Post, 624, 1998. Beijing blusters and Bill blinks. Now you're going to get details on what the Chinese told the United States, just like Kabila and them. We're running the show now. If you, Clinton, want to come to Africa to have a seat, we'll let you. We don't block the plane. But you don't run anything here. We're running the show. So he had to run over there. Now, why is he running to China? Buck Buchanan. On the eve, this is June 24th, 1998. On the eve of Clinton's departure for China, Beijing decided to snap the White House to attention. Now, these are white folks talking about themselves in relation to China. I didn't write this. The final call didn't write it. <laughs> snap to attention with a naked threat. China threatened the United States to send the near bankrupt economies of Asia into free fall. They collapse it all. China's threat took the form of a warning. Either you, United States, and Tokyo intervene to stop the fall of the Japanese yen, or we will let China's currency and the Hong Kong dollar collapse. What did they threaten to do to their money? They'll make it valueless. That's the threat. But you know the United States is rich. It don't mean anything. China was threatening a financial Jonestown. Remember what Jonestown was, right? Everybody died in this one. <laughs> and Richard Pryor tell you, if some, he pull his knife out, if somebody get hurt in there, I'm not going to be the last one. So that's what China is saying. He said China was threatening a financial Jonestown, a U.S. stock market crash while Clinton is standing in Tiananmen Square. Okay? He told him, if you don't do this, let me repeat. A U.S., the China promised Clinton that if he doesn't support that, he will get a U.S. stock market crash while he's standing in Tiananmen Square. That's hardball. China, go on. It worked. Goldman Sachs, Wonder Boy at the Treasury Department, Rubin, ditched his non-intervention. Remember, he just told Congress we ain't lending these people nothing. His intervention to prop up the yen line and dump billions of U.S. dollars to stop it as the White House began to slobber all over the Beijing for its responsibility. Why would Rubin be terrified of Chinese igniting a new round of devaluation? Well, consider the total expenditure And let me give you what I'm reading from, so it will really sink in. I'm reading from this part of it so you can follow it. The most important part of this whole presentation. So you fully understand what is happening in the world today. Let's, when you see the set, we, we're down where Buchanan's face is. You come over to the left, and we're starting at that paragraph. Why would Rubin be terrified of, Jap of Chinese igniting a new round of devaluation? See, they thought they're the only one who can pull the plug from you and you collapse the Southeast Asia. Well, consider the total exposure of Western banks in Asian emerging market. According to the Financial Times of one year ago, U.S. banks had 43 billion of their money in South East Asia. The economy, they, co they collapse the economy so that they can buy up everything for nothing. $43 billion, these are in billions, in, uh, at risk there. Canada's bank had $15 billion. This is U.S. 
Let, let's go. This is U.S. These are trilateral countries. This is Canada. See, trilateral is U.S. and Canada is one part. Western Europe is the second, and Japan is the third. The poor countries were trying to hold on to your wealth. <laughs> Japan, 271, Japan, 271 billion. And Europe, 353 billion. Okay, that's what's invested here. As a share of the, of, as a share or portion of the bank's capital, America has 12%. This money represents 12% of all your money America got tied up in Asia. Canada has 46% of all their money tied up here. Europe has 48% of all its money tied up here. And Japan has 109%. Okay? 109%. Japan is $600 billion in debt they can't collect. You got the game going, and it works as long as the people playing the game are suck it in. Now, when you, understand, when you see this, if China were to devaluate the money, they go on. Put starkly, devaluation by China would set off a new round of currency crisis that would force huge new U.S. IMF bailout or strings of Asian default that could bring down the banks of Japan and Europe and, and precipitate a worldwide financial crisis. That's how they got it hooked up. But when everything is dropping and falling and tumbling, you're still eating in Vanuatu, you're still eating in the Congo, you're still eating. That's why if you listen to Brother Brown on the radio, he tell you, if the computers go out, we, we're not com highly computerized. So you never get away from the land where you can eat and drink water, okay? Three days supply of food to the cities. If three days of supply of foods get cut off to the cities, you're going to have civil war in, this, in, in, in the cities of the United States. You've got to eat. Three days, if there's no food in the supermarket, you see what people will do. Can someone explain what benefit America derives from the global economy to justify this risk? And he goes on. Last week, Beijing demonstrated two things. China fears its own devaluation less than we do. And in the game of chicken, the Americans will blink first. What could we have done with Beijing issuing? And in this middle paragraph, Buckley goes on to start talking about what we could have done and should have done, but the reality, they didn't do it and they can't do it. And let's go down to the middle paragraph, this last paragraph here, as we conclude the article. America has best wake up. Last week's trade numbers were the most ominous yet. Exports to Asia fell as imports soared. The nation is now running a mercantile trade deficit clocked in April at 260 billion. 260 billion. Now, when you consider that the United States has approximately 'Cause United States, in order to finance all this cheap oil and this food and everything, they use a credit card. That's what United States had. This this deficit is a credit card. You are buying more than you earn. So you so you say, okay, I want to pay for oil imports. I don't have two hundred sixty billion dollars to pay. Okay, I'll sell you some Treasury notes, right? Oil. When they say $260 billion worth of mercantile debt, it means that the United States has imported cars, TVs, radio, computers, but don't have the money to pay for it. Don't have anything to barter. So what they do is issue you an IOU, or they issue you a treasury note. Of the $3 trillion in debt that the U.S. have, $1 trillion is owed to foreigners. So if Japan decides to pull its money from the treasury note, the country goes. The thing is, you need food. 
and accelerated last year trade deficits. Well, last year, 200 billion, now it's 260. Th uh, though these gigantic deficits in World Bank and IMF loan, America is shoveling money out to nations that are capturing shares of our home market. Now, how much value could you do? You just keep sending people paper and paper and paper, and you split the stock. Asia has now begun to gear up to export its way out of recession. Those exports are coming our way. Tomorrow's trade deficit will make today's look anemic. Not to worry, Rice's economist, whoever it is, the great portrayal. We send dollars overseas, and we get back neat things. It's a good deal. The wealth and poverty of the nation. Why some are so rich and some are so poor? Comparing us to, he's going back to the history. Comparing us to Holland of centuries ago, this writer writes, as branches of the manufacturing have shrunk. He's paralleling what has happened to America, what happened to Europe, using Holland as an example. As branches of manufacturing have shrunk before foreign competition, enterprises have discharged large labor and moved to lower wage. You see all the layoffs, downsizing. New workers cost less, that's your immigrants. Poor immigrants have kept coming. Unions have struck, sometimes only hastening plant closures and transfers of orders to cheaper labor. The British also embraced the free trade as a matter of faith in economic uh, regions. And this writer said, we and the British rejected all warnings that their industrial supremacy was vanishing. For to accept that was to accept a challenge to the sacred. We follow the same path of, of uh, uh, bur blabbling uh, economists notwithstanding, and it goes on. So I just wanted to let you know to review what has happened when these men meet. And here is Secretary Rubin being assured by the head of the Chinese that they wouldn't devaluate the money and collapse the world economic system and give the United States a stock market crash. And he goes on and they're talking, please don't devalue the money, please. So when they be smiling, it isn't because of anything that he's happy. The Chinese got him. Let's look at what the IMF may look like a year from now, according to the white man who runs the IMF. <laughs> the IMF. This is New York Times, 6-13-1998. You gotta tap into what they're thinking about, not what I say or we want to speculate. Let's see what they say. They're, they're thinking in the future. Recently, several prominent former officials and economists, European and American, called for the abolishment of the IMF. Doesn't work anymore for them. So they don't want it anymore. Congress is also holding back the next thing. So Congress don't want to give the money, and the Europeans no longer want to use it because everybody now knows the game. The big people have dropped out. China's out, India's out, Vietnam is out, most of Central Africa's out, and the African countries already told Clinton, we're doing no trade, you're getting nothing, unless you reduce this foreign IMF debt by 90% at least. They're out of here. So what are they saying, this? Since all these smart people seem to think the world doesn't need the IMF, I say junk it. Here's what the world would look like a year later. Washington, June 13th, 1998, on the first annual anniversary of the closing of the IMF. So they're already a year ahead and they got it shut down. They're telling you what they are looking at in a, in a year. This invincible IMF, you must join the IMF. There's no other way to do it. They're saying since all these, okay, Washington, June 13th, 1998, on the first anniversary of the closing of the IMF, the Russian ruble hit a new low of 50,000 to one. You know Russia has a problem with its economy, and we'll go through that. Russia's president, the former General Lebed. Lebed was a, Ru a young Russian general who was fighting in Chechen. You got some people in Russia that make Hitler look like a playboy, and he's one of them. This, so they're saying that the Russian ruble has collapsed, Russia's in chaos. Russia's president, the former General Lebad, who ousted Boris Yeltsin in a coup, because you know, Yeltsin came in in a coup. Remember they shot up the house and brought the tanks in? Brought in a coup after the Russian economy had collapsed six months ago. And announced a new export program for getting Russia back on its feet. From today forward, the Russian president said, any Russian company capable of exporting any device technology, weapon system, or natural resources. 
including highly enriched radium for atomic bombs, and is encouraged to do so to anyone who can pay hard currency. Everything is for sale. This is your Russian. These are gangsters. That German, that Russian branch of the German family is, I can't know if it's worse than this, what you call U.S. You understand what they're talking about? So that means you could buy anything you want. He says you will sell anything to anybody with hard currency. America's trade deficit hit an all-time high of 400 billion. Remember, it's 260 now, 260 billion. They're, pro they're, they're projecting 400 billion of cheap exports from all over Asia, battling economy, flooding into the United States. Finally, remember in 1945, when you had the uh, Bretton Wood, Bretton Wood. It was in 1945, and it was uh, what, New Hampshire, and it was the US, Britain, and France. Who set up the what? The IMF, the World Bank, and blah, blah. Now, what are they saying? The World Bank is out. Finally, the US called for an emergency meeting of the world's leading industrial nations to try to establish some sort of international monetary fund to deal with the crisis. So they're saying we gotta, we, this is out and that's out, we gotta put together another scheme. America's offered to hold a meeting in a quiet estate in New Hampshire. Again, we did it in 1945, now he wants to come back again in 1999. Repeat it. New Hampshire called the Bretton Woods, but the other world powers showing contempt for a weak United States suggested they have it in Shanghai, China. <laughs> See what's coming. Almost simultaneously, New York Times, 524, 1998. Almost simultaneously, the White House backed down from threats of sanction against European firms for doing business with Iran and Libya these threats sounded tough. Any global country company doing these deals there would be put on notice that it would suffer severe sanctions from the United States. Can't even knock off Cuba, but they're going to sanction somebody. <laughs> the strategy backfired. This is now. This is not speculation. This is what happened this year. We already saw past the So if you're in the year from now, if there's no IMF, they, they, they told you, they're ready to scrap it. The strategy backfired when the United States threatened these companies. Rather than create an alliance against the so-called terrorist state, Libya, and all the people they don't like, it created, an it, it created an alliance against the Americans. Assumption that, white, that Washington could set foreign policy for the world. Albright told you, we run in the world. The problem is that the sanctions implies a leverage we don't have anymore. Anyone, said David Rothkopf, a former top commerce department in 1946, when half of the world's trade went through the United States, we could impose these kind of control. United States was strong. Came out of World War II, the dominant power. That's why they were successful in putting the Shah there, knocking off Mobutu, and they set up Suharto. All of these men, they set up. That's what the United States was powerful. Now you're 30 something years down the road. Not only aren't you the only one who don't have the, the bomb, but China is now in the position that can collapse your whole financial system. China in 1945 wasn't a country. Remember they were fighting? The, after World War II, they fought and then established in 1949. So China has moved from 1949, not in a country, to now can, could, could wield this kind of power. Said so not only in 1946 we in America control, in 1946 when half of the world's trade went through the US, we could impose these kind of controls, but they, when less than 14% comes through the United States. And you see that that 14% is just zizzing away as quickly as we move the factories out, it's rapidly dropping. You can't, at one time, you control the white man control all the oil. He doesn't control it. He controls the copper and the rubber. That control is gone. So they can't squeeze you anymore. 
When they tried to squeeze Cuba, what did Cuba do? The African countries traded. Well, who give Cuba me oil? Mexico, Trinidad, Venezuela, Angola, Nigeria. How are you going to embargo Cuba? And you got all these countries helping Cuba. You no longer control. At one time, they could have controlled it, but they can't do it anymore. Today, when 14% go through the United States, we can't control it. Mr. Clinton was lucky to save face with a deal in which the Allies swore to fight proliferation if America waived these sanctions. First, this is their rule. First is the ideological rule. Passionate national causes, countries, particularly in the urge of self-sufficiency. He's describing what these countries are driving for. Nobody's driving to be a, 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 a lackey to white or Chinese anybody. They said these countries, this is their rule first, is ideological rule. Passionate national causes, particularly in the urge for self-sufficiency, always, almost always, trumps economic rationality. In other words, you can't tell a country like Pakistan, if you drop them, Bob, I'm going to sanction you. So they say, sanction me. Their national pride and their security is more important than a little bit of food. That's why, that's why the Indians pressed the button and why the North Koreans and Iraqis and Serbs have been so adamant. Rule number two. Second is the sanction rule. Unilateral sanctions almost never work, especially if you only control 13% of the world's economy. Global economy. In a global economy, there are too many producers of almost everything. So when brothers and sisters tell you that you must, that Kabila must deal with the United States, they don't deal with it. You can just take the United States and Europe and wipe it off the face of the earth, and Africa would be better off for it. Asians would be better off. There's nothing you have to come to here or the European for. Too. As he say what they tell you, in the global economy, there are too many products, too many producers of almost everything. Finally, the Suharto rule. When you open your...